we come marching, marching in the beauty of the day. A million darkened kitchens, a thousand mill lofts gray, are touched with all the radiance that a sudden sun discloses. For the people here are singing red and roses, red and roses. As we come marching, marching, unnumbered women dead, go crying through our city. Thank you for joining us on Shelter and Solidarity, a deep dive with authors, artists, and activists during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Lena Durkin, and I'm one of the co-producers of Shelter and Solidarity. I am Zooming in from Marshfield, Massachusetts, and I'm very excited to be hosting our three incredible panelists for the show today. We have Hester Eisenstein, Barbara Foley, and Jin Lee. Um, joining us for what should be a really rich discussion reflecting on what International Women's Day um, which was just this past Tuesday means today, as well as what the challenges and opportunities are in 2022 for thinking about and linking the fight against women's oppression and for women's liberation to struggles for a radically better world. Um, so, so I'm going to hand it over to my fellow co-producer, Linda Liu, um, to introduce each of our guests and then just to read a short introduction to the radical history and origins of the holiday of International Women's Day. Um, Linda? Very great. I'm Linda Liu. I am also a co-producer of Shelter and Solidarity. And uh, welcome to our guests and all of our participants today. So um, I'm going to start with the bios. Barbara Foley is Emerita Distinguished Professor of English at Rutgers University, Newark. Her scholarship has ranged over the fields of Marxist literary criticism, literary radicalism, and African-American literature. A communist, feminist, and anti-racist, she came of age politically in SDS during the late 1960s and early 70s longtime former president of the Radical Caucus of the Modern Language Association and current vice president of the Marxist journal, Science and Society. Foley has stressed the importance of anti-racist and anti-sexist proletarian internationalism. She served for two decades long as the chair of the Combating Racism Task Force of NOW, New Jersey. Hester Eisenstein retired with very mixed feelings from mm -hmm. Queens College in August, 2020. She was a professor of sociology and women's and gender studies at Queens College and the Graduate Center, the City University of New York from 1996. From then until 2001, she served as the director of women's studies at Queens. She also served as the founding director of women's and gender studies at the CUNY Graduate Center from 2015 to 2017. Her most recent book is Feminism Seduced, How Global Elites Use Women's Labor and Ideas to Exploit the World. Her previous books include Inside Agitators, Australian Femocrats and the State, Gender Shock, Practicing Feminism on Two Continents, and Contemporary Feminist Thought. She serves on the board of the journal Socialism and Democracy and is a frequent contributor to the annual Historical Materialism Conference in London. And Zhongjing Li is an assistant professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Her research fields include political economy, development economics, comparative economic systems, and East Asian economies. She has published papers on the political economy of development and labor in a variety of academic journals in English and in Chinese. Also writes for Dollars and Cents, Jacobin Magazine, Etc. She's the co editor for China on Strike, published by the Haymarket Books in 2016. Hmm. All right, so I just have uh, a very short blurb on International Women's Day. 
um, which was just this past March 8th. So uh, celebrated annually on March 8th, International Women's Day is a global holiday that honors the achievements of women around the world and calls attention to issues of reproductive rights, gender inequality and violence against women among others. Though International Women's Day has in recent days and years been supported by the likes of defense industry titans like Lockheed Martin and the National Football League, as well as other capitalist interests, feminist and writer Liza Featherstone takes care to point out its origins in the early 20th century socialist feminist and anti-war movements. Since then, as Featherstone writes, International Women's Day presents an annual opportunity to honor the socialist anti-war tradition and invites us to find new ways of bringing it back. What Alexandra Kollontai wrote in 1920 is still true over a hundred years later. This day has remained the working woman's day of militancy. It belongs to us, not to Lockheed Martin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, on to you, Lena. Awesome, thank you so much, Linda. Um, so Hester, Barbara, and John Jin, I wanted to, that's a good lead in into um, my, my first question, um, which is basically, I just wanted to ask if each of you could share and reflect a bit on your own experiences as women and as Marxist feminist scholars, as activists in social movements, um, and based on your activism work and research relating to gender-based oppression and women's liberation, what does inter International Women's Day mean today and what does it mean to you? So we can start with um, Hester and then go to Barbara and Junjin. Thanks, Lena. And thank you all for organizing this wonderful event. Um, so in terms of my background, um, I started out as a very traditional scholar trained in 19th and 20th century French intellectual and political history. Um, I did my dissertation on Victor Cousin, who no one has ever heard of, um, who was a political figure in the July monarchy of the 1840s. Um, and he was the, actually the founder of the philosophy curriculum that is still taught today in French lycées. And he's also, uh, I guess, one of the founders of laïcité, which is a very controversial issue still in France. Um, so my experiences doing dissertation research in France include meeting my first Marxists, hearing my first critique of the US role in Vietnam, reading Simone de Beauvoir, and I came back to the US as a Marxist and a feminist. Um, uh, then I was teaching at Yale and I had a revolution in my classroom in 1970. They wouldn't let me finish my seminar in French intellectual history because my students said it was not relevant. So thereafter, <laughs> Does this sound familiar, Barbara? <laughs> um, so I was hired then to run the experimental college at Barnard, which was part of a widespread um, student critique of the war in Vietnam, the military industrial complex, etc. cetera. Um, at, at Barnard, I was a founder of the Women's Studies Program and of the Scholar and the Feminist conference series, which is still alive and running today. You can find it online. Um, then I moved to Australia with my former husband and got caught up in what was called the Femocratic Movement. This was um, an initiative by the Labour Party, which targeted women's votes by using feminist issues such as childcare, women's health, anti-rape and other programs for women. I met my first Aboriginal activists and I realized the parallel history of genocide in Oz and the United States. Under labor in New South Wales, I became an EEO officer. Um, I came back to the States in 1988. I taught women's studies at the State University of New York at Buffalo, and which was a, a part of a very radical American studies department looking at world history from a Marxist point of view. Um, and I was colleagues with the great um, scholar and activist, the Aboriginal John Mohawk, who taught us all indigenous history. Um, and his dry humor used to 
convey to me a worldview that totally challenged the triumphant narrative of US history that we all taught at Yale. Um, 1996, I was hired to run women's studies at Queens College, which I did for five very frustrating years um, before being folded back into sociology at Queens and the Graduate Center. So my, my activism has really been as a women's studies scholar and as a femocrat. So that's a brief summary. Should I go? Yeah, go ahead, yes. Barbara. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, I'll start off with some <clears throat> historicizing myself in the same way, but a little not so, some things here are not so funny. I, I went to college from 65 to 69. Uh, <clears throat> Hester and I are pretty much the same generation. And when I, when I entered college, uh, if you had a guy in your room, you had to have the door open, <laughs> okay? And if you were headed out for the evening, you had to say who your escort was. Yeah, you did. Uh, by the time I graduated, uh, housing, the, the last year, I mean, the, the, the year following my graduation, the housing had been completely integrated. So just, it was, a, it was a, a different world. I encountered the word and the concept of women's liberation in the summer of 1969, and it thrilled me and frightened me at the same time. This is when Our Bodies Ourselves was just coming out. In fact, I knew indirectly the women who were, who were writing it. I participated in a consciousness raising group in the summer of 1969 with actually a woman who was married to Abby Hoffman who had terrible things to say about Abby Hoffman if you know who that was. I was at the 1969 SDS convention and there was a table where they were selling a pamphlet called the myth of the vaginal orgasm. Okay, I mean this stuff really dates me in a way, right? But that's, that's I was coming of age as a young woman while all of these things were happening. Um, I was, a woman when uh, b before Roe v. Wade came in and I knew I had some friends who had to deal with coat hanger abortions and that was pretty awful. And then fast forward to the early 70s, mid 70s actually when I had my first job, University of Wisconsin. And at the opening social event of the year, there was a, a professor, a male professor named Donald Torciana. He came up to me and he pinched my ass <laughs> while we were drinking beer, right? And I, this is pre Anita Hill, this is pre me too. And one of my female colleagues just told me that I'd been torched and not to worry about it. So that was, you know, the, <laughs> that was the environment then. Now, as, as, a, as a result of my being involved in SDS, um, I gravitated in the late 60s and then into the 70s toward the, the group within SDS called the Worker Student Alliance Caucus, which was organized by PLP, Progressive Labor Party. And out of that, I, I became a communist and have stayed one ever since. Um, what, it, what that meant for me in terms of my activism, see, I, I got to my, my activism in the women's movement a little bit later, uh, actually considerably later, but um, I was completely won over to an internationalist anti-imperialism, obviously the war in Vietnam and seeing it as an imperialist war and not a tragic mistake as the, as the liberals were saying. That led to activism against uh, you know, CIA involvement in Latin America. In fact, I, I lost my job at Northwestern because of activity that I was involved in there. Um, Anti-apartheid activity at both the University of Wisconsin and at Northwestern. Um, I could go you know, on. The Campus Worker Student Alliance is something that I was very involved in in, in graduate school and, and thereafter, which was a way, of course, for students to unite with campus workers. And I was at the University of Chicago for graduate school. So that meant, of course, that you know, we were actively involved in some you know, serious anti-racist one-on-one -on -one, uh, political work. Uh, it was very, very stimulating. Um, it, this whole set of experiences um, enabled me to develop for, for what it's worth, right? Into a very different kind of person than I would have been if I had been a couple of years younger or even a couple of years older. I, I, hit, I hit the international anti-racist, anti-imperialist movement high, high stride, and it had an incredible impact upon me. Mm -hmm. um, I was involved in the anti-busing movement and in, in, in with the opposing the, the racist anti-busing movement in Boston. And then um, also when I was in Chicago, again, I, in graduate student and then coming down from, from Wisconsin, for different rallies, there was a tremendous amount of anti-Nazi activity. And I was going to um, 
baseball games in Gage Park, which was an area where the Nazis were active, where you had you you brought your own bat. <laughs> Got it? All right. So this was this is not what you expect, you know, your average female academic to have experienced. And I feel incredibly fortunate that then my, my coming into history and into politics at the time when I did enabled me to have that, that set of, of, of activities and commitments. During all of that, um, gender questions were part of it, but never main, the main focus for me. For example, when we were talking about the economics of racism, we were active with a group called the Mother's Committee to Smash the Flat Grant, which was a welfare rights group. Um, their black working class women were in, in, in the lead of all of that. But for me, that was one more of many things that I was doing. So just to, to forward, fast forward, uh, when, when we moved to um, New Jersey in the 1990s after I was summarily dismissed from Northwestern University, which I alluded to before, that's when I decided to become involved in the women's movement. Um, I'd always really felt very strongly about abortion. And so I immediately got into uh, going to the, the, the local NOW meetings, NOW stands for National Organization for Women, escorting at uh, abortion clinics on Saturday mornings. So I did it for about three, three years in a row, including, you know, when it was pretty cold. Um, and that, you know, with these fundamentalist Christian crazies, you know, showing up these big signs, you're killing your baby and all of that, that sort of concretized a lot of my, of my gut level commitment that I needed to be there. We did a lot of other things. We went down to Washington DC to oppose the promise keepers, if you remember who they were. And we had a good agitation around important economic demands like paid family leave. But um, what was the, the core of my activity there, and I'll try to summarize this quickly, um, was working with the Combating Racism Task Force and with the Women of Color Allies chapter of the Essex, of Essex County now. And um, when, I, when I first was involved in that, the Combating Racism Task Force was a bunch of white people sitting around flagellating themselves for being white and not doing anything. And uh, a group of us decided that we were gonna actually fight racism and deal with the way that sexual harassment is especially affected black women, police brutality as a women's issue, all kinds of things having to do with the welfare reform. At a certain point, a bunch of us went down to Trenton and disrupted a hearing or they were trying to impose you know, the new regime, which of course they did get away with. But um, what, I, what I learned through all of that is that fighting racism for a white person cannot be a matter of, 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 ex, of you know, exp, you know, getting rid of your guilt or something like that. that, that multiracial unity and the actual struggle in the streets was to me just the most important thing to do. And so, that's, that's an experience that, you know, again, this was all happening while, of course, I had two children and I was teaching and active with the Modern, Modern Language Association Radical Caucus, but that was sort of like a different part of my life. Here I'm talking about the in the streets activism. And um, I, I think that that's the kind of thing that International Women's Day stands for, in addition to the incredibly important, of course, scholarly and theoretical work that people like Hester have done over the years. So um, the last thing I would say about now, now New Jersey, is that it was a contradiction because I was sort of getting to know what I thought were the best people in the organization. And we were bringing around a much more diverse multiracial group of women. But um, now then as now, as now, is, was, is completely in the tip pocket of the Democratic Party. Okay, so the reform activity was sincere. I don't think it's fair to say that it's there it was just a bunch of bourgeois women, but the leadership had a bourgeois consciousness, which is, you know, in a way almost worse. So there are serious limitations to that now work. And after after almost 20 years, I finally, well, I retired and I, you know, started doing other things in my life. But I, I don't think I could have kept it up just because. Um, you know, the, 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 the toxic effect of the Democratic Party and those liberal politics is just really bad. And I'm sure that they're all involved in everything that that signifies right now and supporting Kamala Harris as she goes over to try to, you know, shore up NATO. So um, anyhow, over and out. Thanks. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for that, Barbara. Um, go to John Jin next. Okay, sure. Um, hello everyone. Um, I am Zhongjing Li, and uh, 
uh, I was really fascinated by Barbara and Hester's experience. I feel like I came from a very different background and also a very different um, time period. Um, so I want kind of to wrap up my own experience um, in terms of different positions or possible positions I occupy. I see myself occupy um, kind of as a woman um, four possible positions in connection with my other social economic status. The first, of course, is I'm a woman confronting patriarchal gendered um, arrangement in um, the society. Um, but um, the second is I'm also a woman who kind of experienced the um, significant uh, or the tremendous transformation of women's status and women's movement back in China. Uh, my own experience growing up in the 1980s kind of put me in a status that kind of literally witnessed and experienced a significant decline in care support from the public sector and a significant increase of the um, care burden back to individual household. Um, so I want to kind of put this as a context for um, the discussion later, I will also emphasize. Um, but I am also growing up as a single daughter from an urban family. So I definitely had a, a lot of privileges compared to many women in China these days. I enjoyed relative freedom in my education, in my career choices, uh, as well as other kind of um, life decisions, which were or still are not available to many of my um, peers in China. So um, to this extent, I want to kind of emphasize um, how this helped me to make a lot of historical reflections about my own experience as well as my comparison with um, other people as well as the uh, entire country that experienced the socialist revolution, but later experienced uh, um, a lot of setbacks for women. Um, the third position I want to emphasize is um, I'm as a woman from the global south that was still heavily embedded in the very unequal international um, labor, this, um, kind of division of labor and the current um, <coughs> labor, international uh, labor system still heavily benefited the global north. Uh, I got really interested in the political economy of um, women, this particular question from the entering point of labor. I initially was very interested in the labor question, how um, China ended up in this kind of world factory in the global system and how this had significant consequence to the Chinese working class. And then gradually I um, had experience working with female labor activists back in China and I did some field work with them and started to dig into the history of that whole transformation. Uh, social transformation. And I kind of um, still heavily question and challenge this kind of work, labor distribution. And that's part of the reason I, in my own work, um, a large chunk of my work focused on the uh, land and the labor issue in China, particularly when the economy was hit by the crisis. I got into political economy research um, from the observation of China's response, China's um, experience in the crisis. And I paid my attention, I focused more on how uh, migrant women um, were largely caught in the middle of a globalized production as well as increasing household labor upon them. So how the villages distributed land to women or deprived their right to land as well as how urban um, precariousness put them on um, further problematic positions in their own decisions. 
So that was kind of my um, research interest and also my own kind of activist uh, background. Um, the last point I want to make is my own position, current position as a female um, scholar in academia. I think all of us experience the increasing precariousness in academia in the US higher ed, not just the US, um, the global new liberal higher ed. So we also experience um, how like this whole systematic um, deterioration changed our own labor condition and changed our organizational abilities, limited our organizational abilities. Um, I want to kind of bring up one uh, similar talk I just had this week um, on the International Working Women's Day on campus. At UMKC, we organized, uh, me and my colleagues organized a similar uh, roundtable discussion, and we brought local female electricians from the local electrician labor union, and also some activists from female activists from um, immigration network. And we also brought labor activists for um, the heartland Midwest to discuss the origin of the International Working Women's Day. And I feel um, these kind of activities helped to remind people the radical history of this particular celebration and also to empower myself as well as others probably in the academia who sometimes felt very powerless and even to some extent um, um, you know possibly depressed due to our um, isolation so I feel this is something uh, I would probably do more in the future and I'm really glad to be invited here to further the discussion yeah thank you Thank you so much for all of those very insightful reflections. Um, so now I want to pivot um, to my next question um, to discuss something that um, Barbara actually brought up in her introduction already, and also um, Hester, what your latest book, Feminism Seduced, um, kind of talks about, which is this very concerning and dangerous phenomenon that we've seen in mainstream feminism, where we're seeing elites um, in the ruling class appropriating the language of feminism and co-opting ideas of women's liberation and women's empowerment. Um, so my question for you is how exactly have ruling elites and institutions, governments and corporations managed to successfully co-opt feminism or um, you know certain kinds of feminisms? And to what degree do you think mainstream feminism has kind of devolved into a feminism that is being used more as a tool for the 1% and what the implications are of that. Okay, thank you, Lena, for that question. Um, so I wanna go back to the origins of the contemporary women's movement in the States, um, which as everybody knows was a followed on and was very inspired by the civil rights movement. And historians conventionally refer to two wings of the women's movement. The radical movement arose out of the new left and was linked to socialist Marxist position. And the more conventional mainstream movement arose originally, which some, nobody knows, but arose out of the US labor movement actually, going back to the 1930s and 40s. And, but nonetheless was fairly moderate seeking gradual change within the system. So the energy and the popularity of what became known as feminism as opposed to women's liberation, reached a high watermark, I would say, with the Roe v. Wade decision protecting abortion in 1973, which of course is now incredibly in danger. And I think this scared the ruling class and they went about combating this radicalism with many different of co-optation. And they, and they followed what I would call a two-class strategy. So for upper class women, they opened the doors of all elite institutions in government and corporations to a new class of women's ma women managers. So Yale goes co-ed, Dartmouth goes co-ed, 
So this is the upper class, ruling class strategy. Women as managers, middle class and upper class women are welcomed into virtually all areas of public life, which was revolutionary, but nonetheless diabolical. Um, and then the second tier of the strategy was to abolish welfare as we know it under Clinton. And you know, the welfare rights movement was one of the important predecessors of mainstream feminism. Um, so this sent millions and millions of poor and working class women into the low paid labor force as the US economy transitioned from primarily manufacturing to what economists call a service economy. Think General Motors giving way to Walmart and McDonald's. So women's paid labor becomes crucial to a newly globalizing economy in industries such as electronics, textiles, clothing manufacturing, footwear, think Nike. So, and now we have the return of the early 20th century sweatshop now distributed around the world, Haiti to Turkey to Vietnam. So now ideologically, the, and this is another part of the ruling class strategy, the agenda of the radical women's movement was narrowed down radically. So particularly mm -hmm. among socialist or Marxist feminists, the goals of this revived movement were very, very radical. Everything came under scrutiny, gender, marriage, violence against women, sexuality, race and racism, the state, militarism and war, you name it. This agenda, which was revolutionary, and if allowed to spread, would be very, very, very dangerous to the institutions we now live under. And so I believe that the capitalist ruling elite, and I always, I'm telling this story, it's very non-empirical. I have never interviewed any of these corporate fascist types myself. This is my interpretation of what they brought about. Um, so this agenda is cleverly winnowed down to one broad aim, which is the integration of women into the paid labor force. And ironically, Barbara will laugh at this, this corresponds to the original vision of Friedrich Engels, which was integration of women into paid labor would signal their liberation from the oppression of marriage. And in a funny way, I think he was right. But anyway, enter corporate feminism. So I just have to bring you today's Twitter message from Buick. Are you ready? So this is a quote. This is from my Twitter feed. On March 18th, 2018, Elizabeth Guigier scored one of the most clutch goals in NCAA history, but you probably didn't see it. Let's shine a greater spotlight on women athletes so that we can all hashtag see her greatness. Over 40% of athletes are women, but they get less than 10% of the media coverage. Buick, the car company, is committed to raising that percentage. Isn't that fabulous? So, so by the way, just so you know, this Guigier, she said, Elizabeth Guigier is this brilliant Canadian um, ice hockey star for the Canadian Golden Knights. And this is an account of her winning the final goal. So that's, that's corporate feminism. I mean, in a nutshell, it's like more visibility for women and that's it. Um, so the women's liberation movement is reduced to integrating women into capitalism via the class system. Working class women as the new labor force of choice, <clears throat> middle and upper class, class women as managers with access to all areas of the economy from media to government. And International Women's Day then becomes the occasion for corporations, corporations excuse me, to honor women for their loyal contributions to the capitalist system. So that's my analysis in, in brief. Great, thank you. Um, so, you know, when we're talking about how to really understand the roots of um, gender-based oppression um, and thinking about how that links to, to class, um, I wanna ask you, Barbara, uh, to talk about a little bit about the Marxist critique of intersectionality um, that you've done 
some work in writing on um, as intersectional feminism has risen to prominence within the feminist movement. Um, so what do you see as the deficiencies of intersectionality as an explanatory framework um, for understanding um, gender-based oppression? And then how can class analysis then act as a more effective tool for understanding the true roots of women's oppression in capitalist uh, socioeconomic systems? Um, okay. Yeah. That's a little question, <laughs> that's a tiny one. <laughs> just, just before I, and I'm gonna reverse the, the, the two, um, but I just wanted to make a footnote to some of what um, Hester was, was saying. We, we, can't, we can't forget the role played by uh, female honcho politicians, you know, from Marilyn Albright to Hillary Clinton to, you know, all of these people in charge of the IMF and all of, I mean, they're a lot, you got a lot of women in charge of a lot of big time capitalist corporations and also um, governments and government organs. And um, if anyone thinks that they have the interests of the working women of the world at heart, you know, I think we, we have another thing coming. That's not the case. Um, wait a second, I'm just trying to get out of full screen. I, I never, oh gosh, exit full screen, sorry. Um, the other thing I just, um, I wanted to mention something about the welfare rights movement, which I think it was very important that Hester mentioned that. And, um, you know, this is Bill Clinton talking about personal responsibility at the same time he couldn't keep his pants up. Remember, he said, but women, we're, these women on welfare have to have personal responsibility. I mean, the sheer idiotic hypocrisy was there for everyone to see. But um, I think it's important to recognize the role that racism played in allowing the attack on the welfare reform to go through. Um, now opposed it, but didn't very much. And the other women's groups didn't do everything that they could. And to a large degree, the, the egregiously racist stereotype of the, well, of the average welfare recipient as having 10 children and driving around in a pink Cadillac really went unchallenged. And uh, that had toxic effects on all women who were on welfare. And as a matter of fact, while disproportionately women of color were the recipients of, of welfare, uh, actually, in terms of raw numbers, white women were the majority. So it's a, it's a concrete instance of how racism hurts the entire working class, including white people. And I, I think that that's, you can make the case, you know, in, in terms of uh, you know, racism as well. I just think it's, you know, a really, really important point to, 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 to get at. Um, okay, just in, in terms of the, the critique of intersectionality, <laughs> it's, it's, it's intersectionality has its points on a descriptive level. In other words, if a woman is a person of color and is disabled or, you know, you know, one can sort of pile on the kinds of things. I don't mean to do it in a stereotypical kind of way. You know, obviously there, it, it, that the intersectionality describes the ways in which as Claudia Jones put it many years before, you know, you could have triple oppression of various kinds. But um, the way that the intersectional theorists come up with it is that they basically are posing that the, the, it's an intersection of different oppressions which can all be disarticulated from one another. So you have white supremacy causing anti-black racism, okay? And you have capitalism causing what's called classism, okay? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you, these things are disarticulated from one another such that one doesn't really understand that there is a totalizing structure that includes all of those things. And that's where I think, you know, the, the Marxist analysis is, is, is fundamental. I mean, it's basic political economy. Women, I'll just you know, run through it quickly. It's probably familiar to everyone, but um, these are sort of the fundamentals that women perform because it's generally women, though men sometimes do it as well, unwaged labor in the home, which produces the commodity labor power, right? On a generational basis, children, on a daily basis, people going out to work. So that the use value that of women's work doesn't have any exchange value. It's undervalued, but it certainly produces this commodity called labor power, which is sold in, you know, in, in a way that's you know, incredibly exploitative, right? And it's been estimated that the unwaged labor performed by women, you know, it's, it's, it, it amounts to about $11 trillion a year in an $80 trillion world economy. That's a staggering figure, staggering. $11 trillion a year is the is what would be paid to these women if in fact you know the, the value of, of what they do is was, was realized and there are other ways of course that you know porn 100 billion dollars a year prostitution 200 billion dollars a year etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. 
But this devaluation of women's labor in, in the home with, because it doesn't produce surplus value, then leads to all kinds of ways in which sexism, and this is a really important point of view from, from, the, from the standpoint of Marxist critique, because what the sexism in the standard home does is it naturalizes hierarchy and it naturalizes domination, right? So that people can simply come into the world thinking that this kind of inequality you know, pertains. And um, this is the, the challenge to Marxism here is to portray things in a sufficiently mediated way so that we can see things like attack on trans people or attacks on abortion rights and link these to their grounding in capitalism without just making it seem to be immediately economic determinist because you can't make that kind of argument. They're, they're, these mediating categories are really crucial. Uh, literary works I've found, I'm a professor of English or was, are really, really useful in portraying some of these mediations. So like the novels of Anne Petrie, of Tilly Olson, two great proletarian writers, Helena Maria Veramontes, you know, lay out you know, a lot of this. Um, so coming back to intersectionality, um, it, it, cannot, it cannot begin to describe the ways in which capitalism su supplies a structure into which racism fits, sexism fits, nationalism fits, all kinds of things fit, okay? And to say that they fit doesn't mean to reduce everything to class. It means that a class analysis provides the overarching perspective which enables you to understand how these different forms of oppression figure. And existentially, they can be felt more immediately than the oppression that a person feels as a member of the working class. I mean, if, if you have the fist going in the face, that's pretty, that's more immediate, right? Than, 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 than a felt economic oppression or you know, oppression on the job. And yet um, it's by, 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 by linking all of these different forms of oppression back to the larger structure of capitalist exploitation that I think Marxism can provide an analysis that intersectionality simply can't. Um, I'd love to hear you know, questions about this or challenges from, you know, from the audience about this or my, my fellow panelists, but that, that's a, a point that I think really you know, is, is a fundamental to the kind of Marxist critique that's needed these days, okay? Particularly given the kinds of conversations that are going on among progressive-minded people. Thank you, Barbara, such great points there. Um, and I think it's a great lead into my Next question for Jean Jin um, on kind of the topic of the devaluation of women's labor and the gender division of labor under capitalism. Um, and I again want to thank Jean Jin Lee for stepping in last minute. We so appreciate you being here. Um, so I wanted to ask you if you could kind of discuss the crisis of care that we've been seeing has been severely worsened and exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as we know, which the burden of, of this crisis has disproportionately fallen onto women. Um, and you've written a piece recently on the impact and response to this issue, specifically in China. Um, but my question is kind of, what are the deficiencies of the current privatized and commodified framework of care provision? And then how does community-centered infrastructure and socializing care work provide a hopeful and viable alternative to that framework um, either in China and you can also talk about um, you know how that ties to the rest of the world as well. Sure. Um, thank you Lena for the great question. Yeah um, I just want to kind of um, um, encourage us to think about how the current pandemic right this still ongoing pandemic, has significant impact on the already um, problematic care landscape. Uh, many people pointed out um, this whole thing was not kind of new because uh, in, you know, when people, especially feminist political economists analyzed the impact of social structural adjustment program, uh, structural adjust um, program, as well as the 2008 financial crisis, they already have kind of pointed out how women um, systematically um, suffered from the impact of these crises, these policy interventions. Um, but this one is this COVID pandemic was new in the sense that it's so deep 
in changing the organization of work, uh, which has a significant impact on um, labor analysis as well as on us who seriously questioned and challenged the capitalist arrangement. So um, many people have already pointed out that even before the pandemic hit the whole global economy, uh, the new liberal capitalism already kind of um, generated what I would say um, Nancy Fraser mentioned as a dualized organization of social reproduction. Right? It kind of uh, commodifiers uh, for those who can afford to buy the service from the labor uh, from the market and also privatized as household work for those who cannot. And uh, we are seeing an increasing um, number of female labor along with um, some male labor as well from both Global North and the Global South working in the second category, right? And provide care work in return for low wage for those in the first category who could afford to buy from the market. So the pandemic in this sense uh, very much exacerbated this, uh, this kind of care crisis. Um, when my co-authors Ying Chen and Yang Zhan and I focused on the work in China, we observed a very similar trend. We are seeing families and uh, uh, market especially families are internally or inherently vulnerable to deal with their members to take care of families in such a large scale public health crisis. And the market cannot offer an alternative, a viable alternative to assist the vulnerable families. We are seeing women already taking care of their um, housework and from the time use survey, um, three quarters of housework were actually done by women already before the pandemic, right? So when the whole thing happened, women started to show them more care work when their children were left at home, things like that. So um, I'm not going to repeat this because I feel many people here also experienced the same thing and it has been repeated um, in other places as well. I just want to bring up one possible um, institutional framework for us to consider a possible alternative, right? When individual families are so vulnerable to do these things, but we do need these kind of last mile delivery of healthcare as well as support uh, from the state or from other you know, public sector to get over the pandemic, um, and to get back to um, kind of a relatively healthy um, arrangement, okay, probably will never be, but um, I want to bring up this um, current arrangement in China, which can kind of help us to consider if there might be a social arrangement that mm -hmm. can unite yeah. more men and women to uh, support this arrangement. And this is what I would call the community-centered social infrastructure. Um, in China, the state started to employ and also called for a lot of social resources to help together organize the, uh, community level services that is de de directly delivered to individual household. The first thing they did is they provided necessities for women to also for, for families to take care of their members, right? So individual families don't have to take the risk to go grocery shopping or to do some kind of health checks. There would be community workers coming to your um, door and deliver the food, deliver the necessary drugs and make sure that during the quarantine, things can be taken care of. And this is really addressing the prevention of the spread of the virus, rather than focusing on a very kind of capital intense solution of um, vaccine, right? Because before the vaccine was really available, become available, this is very crucial for us to make sure less vulnerable population were exposed to the virus. Um, but on the other hand, we can also consider this community-centered infrastructure 
um, has become a great equalizer. Given the more and more marketization, liberalization process in China and in other parts of the world, we are seeing polarizing income as well as other type of social economic benefits distributed in an increasingly unequal way. So rich or relatively wealthy communities were able to offer some resources to their community members, while um, relatively poor or especially migrant worker concentrated communities were not able to provide from their own resources. In this sense, a community centered, a relatively institutionalized nation level community centered infrastructure really provided health care or health support um, just like we need highway or railway right, to, to deliver food, that infrastructure will helping us to deliver the last mile healthcare to the individuals, to the individual families. Um, we also think in addition to those two, uh, by the way, more than 70% of the population in China reported from a nationwide survey saying that they received more help from community workers compared to their individual family members. Part of the reason is um, given the increasing social uh, um, geographical locations, right? Like mobilities, families are, families are more likely to live apart. So individual households are more likely to receive community help and many of um, cities provide quite sufficient ones. So, um, in this sense, we think community-centered uh, infrastructure also provide something to unite men and women because healthcare mm -hmm. burden is not just on women, right? It is also on men as well. And when women um, have to take care of more care, men were also doing more increasing work to bring the money to cover the cost of living. Okay, this kind of gendered arrangement sometimes changes, but still pretty much persistent. So in this sense, we think it kind of revitalized a collective memory and emotion on public support of, chair, of care. When mm -hmm. I was little, you know, kindergartens mm -hmm. were free. I grew up in free childcare, but this whole thing was gone. Right when I became someone who probably need to consider the care burden, the public support mm -hmm. of care was not there anymore. Right, but so we think the pandemic um, time, community-centered infrastructure infrastructure could be a starting point for people to imagine more collective support of care, especially from public sector especially for a country with labor resources. Right? A lot of Global South countries are quite rich in labor resource, but not that ready to um, develop their own vaccine. And given the very unequal distribution of vaccine globally, right, they were not able to do that. So we need to think something probably going back to the previous um, Mao's time, right? Labor accumulation for a poor country. How to do this by accumulating the labor resources they have and provide care mm -hmm. provisionings. And care, by the way, is heavily labor intense. So this would be a great opportunity for us to, to consider um, an alternative. And China is not the unique country that emphasizes community support to combat the virus and to uh, deal with the health crisis. We are seeing other socialist kind of um, economies or um, capitalist countries with relatively strong state sector or public sector are doing similar things, but not probably in a very institutionalized way. They are providing them, for example, um, like we are seeing Cuba, Venezuela have very similar institutionalized community support we are seeing countries like Japan, Singapore had similar but more ad hoc community uh, services set up during the time of the pandemic, right? So this is really calling for us to be 
um, broader, I think, to um, not just think about the gender division only, but to consider possible ways to unite with other movements that would demand more public support. I also want to say with more people um, keeping this kind of awareness and also transfer that awareness to actual action to demand more public service, I think this will increasingly add the burden to the capitalist class. Whether the state would be able to afford this demand to satisfy the demand is heavily in question. And this might trigger some more radical movements um, to help us to sustain ourselves, also to work with other progressive movements as well. Um, this is kind of, it, it's from an academic paper, but the reason for us to start even thinking of the paper was roughly, I mean, I, I think it was because we observed the very different pandemic response from different countries, from different social economic systems. And I think this kind of comparison can give us more space to envision an alternative. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um... Yeah, we've already covered so much ground, so many interesting perspectives. Um, so thank you. Um, so to end this initial uh, part of the Q&A, um, before we get into some questions from our audience, which um, if anyone has any questions, please put those in the chat or um, you can message me or one of the other co-producers uh, privately and I can um, relay them back to the speakers. Um, so I just have one more question, which is kind of a, a bigger picture question for, for that I I'm hoping to hear from all of the panelists on kind of the future of the women's movement. Um, so considering all of these crucial issues that we've discussed so far, what kind of aspirations, ideas, and goals do you see as kind of the key in, in terms of either or, either or both ideology and strategies um, to building a truly progressive, international, um, revolutionary movement for women's liberation? And then I guess the other part is kind of how can we link these, these struggles against um, gender-based oppression and gender inequality to other revolutionary struggles, um, such as anti-imperialism, anti-capitalism, anti-racism, which we've already kind of touched on, um, and others. So we can go in whatever order um, you want. I guess we can go back to Hester first. Okay, thanks, Lena. Um, so this question of how to build a wider movement um, linking feminism to other revolutionary struggles. I wanna go back to um, some of the most compelling work in the original women's studies movement. Um, and particularly I'm thinking of the work of the late historian Gerda Lerner, who traced the origins of patriarchy to the rise of the state in ancient Mesopotamia. And Raina Rapp and Eleanor Leacock, who were the anthropologists who looked at the transition from small tribal societies to state power, which over the millennia took away the social influence and decision-making power from women. So I'm referring to a very powerful link between patriarchy and state power and militarism, which we now see in the tragic events unfolding in the Ukraine. Now, I think today's feminist activists are very aware of the other social struggles of our time, Black Lives Matter and the activism around the murder of, of George Floyd, the fight for trans rights, issues around clean water in Flint and so many other communities, and we could list so many other issues. So, you know, around the world, there are small experiments going on. The um, MST movement in Brazil, the, the, un, the people without land, um, the Zapatistas in Mexico, the socialist communes that are still around in Venezuela that are seeking to basically to create an alternative non-capitalist society. Now there's some, there's some good news. Chile has moved to the left in its most recent election. Argentina, Mexico, Uruguay, Colombia, and Nepal 
have legalized abortion, not so much here, but the, these are little pockets and moments we can look at, but the globalized international economic and financial system with its powerful engines of control is not going to give up without a huge, many generational fight. So I think just from my perspective, it's, a, it's crucial for those of us who identify as feminists to figure out what kinds of social struggles we can be part of and seek lines of communication with whatever anti-capitalist forces we can identify. Um, now, we, we note that International Women's Day has become a capitalist festival. And I just point to, I don't know if you wanna look this up, but you know Mika Brzezinski from MSNBC, daughter of the Brzezinski that basically organized the Mujahideen to bring down the Soviets in Afghanistan. <laughs> mm -hmm. She's an avatar of feminism, right? So she had, she had a Women's Day gathering in Doha from March 6th to March 9th. It's a cross-generational event in collaboration with the financial publication Forbes. So that's, you know, the current International Women's Day. So I think we, who, well, people who are looking, trying to look in a different direction, have to restore the day as a time to reclaim that utopian vision that was held by our working women forebears like Clara Zetkin and so many others to seek a world without war, without patriarchal violence, without racism, and where children can grow up in peace without any form of oppression. Here, here. <laughs> I'm so I, I I got knocked off for a few minutes there. I don't know what happened. So I, I missed part of what what. Um, Esther had to say, did, did Jongjin, did you say anything before that no. or what it just was Hester? Okay. Um, I guess there, there's a lot that Hester said. I, I wanted to just, um, which is absolutely vital. I love what Jongjin said toward the end of her, of her presentation there about how the fact that there was this really interesting tapping of the labor and the consciousness and the mutual love even, <laughs> Though I don't want to sentimentalize it in the community as a revitalizing a collective memory. And you mentioned Maoism. And of course, you know, you know, China, in my view, has pretty much gone pretty far down the capitalist road. But I've been, I've visited four times and I get a sense too of those memories are very real. And I just think that those memories can be, we can continue them. We can, we can turn things around. And um because I, I, I think that, that ultimately, and this is I think embedded in what Hester was saying, is that it's only in a society that's based upon principles of complete equality, which of course I call communism, a society where you don't even have money, right? So you can't have devalued labor because all socially necessary labor is seen as equally valuable. If we had that kind of vision, you know, beyond the division of the metal and manual labor and all of the all of the trash that goes with working and not working under capitalism. I, if we keep that in mind, I'm not saying we can wave a wand and, and, and make it happen. But I think that particularly with the, the environmental crisis that's on us, I and mean, we don't have, you know, when I was young, I thought, well, we, you gotta get the revolution right <laughs> because, you know, and if you don't get it right in this decade, the next one or the next one or the next one. And I, I think we're under a lot of pressure to have a revolution, which is gonna get rid of capitalism sooner rather than later. And what I just find so inspiring about what both of my other panelists have, have said here is that the capacity for it is right there. You know, the, the workers yes. can run the world now. I mean, we have a few glitches to get out of the way, right? But the, the will is there and to a large degree, the capability is there and we can organize ourselves to do it. So I, I just think that, you know, whatever immediate quote unquote reform struggle we're involved in, and of course we're all up to our eyeballs and things that we that need to be done in immediate sense, that there's just this vision of that other world, which is just around the corner there. It's there, it's, it's, it's subliminal. It's, it's, you know, it's something for us to, 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 to grasp if we just think it through. So it's, it's just a, a bid for us to, 
to view the communist potential that exists right now in the present and not view it as some sort of future mode of production. Um, we, 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 have the, we have the capacity to make a lot of it happen fairly quickly. And um, so anti-racist internationalism, I think is, 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 is the key there. I just hope that doesn't sound too utopian because actually it's that vision that keeps me going uh, every day. I, um, I feel the um, kind of that kind of encouragement was really um, like making me feel way more energetic, you know, <laughs> like just thinking of the very first time I was really complaining how, how the academic sometimes would really disempower me. Like I, I feel really excited now. Um, so when, when we, I think when we emphasize the alternative, we also have to, like from the other side, we can consider how um, the current um, global economic system is is increasingly likely to self-produce more ecological, epidemiological, economic emergencies, like crises. So to some extent, I think we should um, consider not these, these kind of things, as I mentioned, possibly, you know, alternative arrangement, institutional arrangement to socialize the cost or to maximize the effectiveness of disease um, in a way to really test how resilient the system is still possibly be or, or could possibly be. To some extent, I think we are basically thinking um, what might be the alternative, especially when the current one is more and more in danger. And, um, it is one thing that we would like to kind of change the current one, but it is the other thing we should make sure the ordinary people, the working class, do not suffer too much in the change of the, the society when these kind of crises uh, happen or uh, become more and more often. Um, I also want to echo what um, Hester and Barbara mentioned earlier. I want to kind of um, in terms of how we should uh, work with the other um, movements. Mm, one, one example I want to kind of mention is back in 2014, China had the largest white cat strike. Uh, that was a strike uh, which happened in the so-called Yuan Shoe Factory. It produced, it is, was the largest shoe factory in the world. And many of us probably would have more than one pair of shoes coming from the factory. And that factory had more than 40,000 workers in one factory plant. And 78.2% of their factories are migrant workers there. And it, very different from their previous demands for a higher wage or a higher, you know, um, or a better working conditions. These people directly demanded for more social security entitlements. So I think there is a glowing, um, very clear, visible awareness of the cost of reproduction, not just covering my current labor reproduction. Right, but also to cover the future, how I would sustain even later, I might not be able to work. I might just be a human being living in a society that right. I have that right. So, um, and I want to kind of cite two quotes I got from the field. One is to rebel is right. This is kind of echoing what Barbara mentioned, right? We have this kind of historical memory and they actually used the historical rhetoric to justify and to defend their own interest. And they were very strategic. Female um, workers on strike would actually protect the male activists. They put them in the middle so the policeman could not actually touch the male one. Mm -hmm. right? So it was very exciting and it was such a solidarity among all workers there. The second quote is from a female worker. She clearly mentioned in our factory, women hold up more than half the sky. Right? Right. So again, this was kind of from the Maoist time saying women hold up the 
uh, hold up half the sky, but these workers are very clearly aware of this <laughs> and more than half of the sky, right? So um, I, I just want to kind of bring this up and I feel um, to some extent, whenever I um, observe how workers or trace how workers deal with their struggles and how female workers connect their um, struggles in the workplace, and a wider social struggles, I feel more empowered. Um, but I also observed a very, as I mentioned, the gender setback I faced uh, um, by a lot of women in China as well as in other parts of the world. As Hester mentioned, we are seeing increasing um, consumerist way to interpret women's day. When I was, in primary school, we would still celebrate um, March 8th as International Working Women's Day, although we actually didn't really um, know much about the radical history, but we know it's kind of a woman's day. And uh, it has some kind of relation with working woman and um, women had some benefit like Chinese women would have one day off on that particular day and everyone knows March the 8th is, is Women's Day right but by the time I went to college the entire I would say the social rhetoric has changed to the extent that college uh, women actually celebrate something called Girls Day on March the 7th which was reframed as a day that boys should treat women, girls nicely, or should buy something for women, or women should can buy something at a great discount on that particular day, right? It became a shopping day. So, so that's why I just feel like you see, you observe this great difference between different social groups, and you do observe women that belong in these two groups advance their own demands in different ways, right? In more middle-class urban women, they kind of celebrate this as consumerist kind of uh, celebration, but they were also very much increasingly suffering from the increasing burden of labor care, so uh, 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 care work. Um, but on the other hand, I feel like women who are actually working women they are way more radical to really demand something very much into the core of the capitalist exploitation. So um, that's why I just feel like um, it's kind of interesting. And this is not just uh, isolated in China, right? And China's uh, transformation was very much um, echoed by the global change. In fact, the Chinese mainstream gender was actually after 1995 when China hosted the International Women Conference. So the entire rhetoric about how working women should be um, part of the revolution or is a great force of revolution in the late 1980s and the 1990s was entirely transformed as a Western liberal way of gender, women's uh, movement, things like that. So I, I feel this kind of international or historical reflection uh, is very important these days. And we should consider how to restore these different um, kind of radical elements of International Women's Day today. Yeah, yeah definitely. Thank you so much. Um, so we actually have a few uh, audience or questions from the audience that I've received in the chat so far. Um, so we have a question about the guest experiences with bourgeois organization from Kalia Dea. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, so I will hand it over to you, Kalia, for um, for that question. Thank you, Lena. And yeah, you said my name correctly. Um, so I was wondering for everyone I'm on the panel. Um, if you've been in, I'm assuming so, you know, organizations um, claiming to be feminists, which really were more centered on the issues of white upper class women. And if so, how were you able to challenge, you know, the, the narrow scope um, to include issues as well of um, people of color and gender nonconforming people? Uh, Hester, you want to take that? Well, I'll just... Um... 
I'll just mention uh, the experience that I had um, inside the women's studies movement before I went to Australia. Um, the women's studies association meetings were like a sea of white faces. And um, while I was in Australia, there was a kind of a revolution within, within women's studies. And now the national organization is very, very interracial and very radical. Um, so, but I had a funny experience. One of my colleagues recounted to me the kind of confrontations that went on during that transition. And um, I said to her, you know, when she was being accused of racism and not understanding the issues of women of color. And I said, well, how did you respond? I mean, what did you say? And she said, oh, I just cried. <laughs> I thought, oh, <laughs> that's not really, that's not really a concrete response to the issues, you know? But um, I think there's been a transformation in the Women's Studies Association. And in general, I would say um, the Women's Studies movement, I think has been admirable in, in really transforming itself and being transformed by the, by the demands of women of color, like you know, my colleague, Premila Nadison at Barnard and so many other leaders. Um, so it's, it's a testament to how some organizations can change. I'm not saying that would be true for the majority, but uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a kind of comforting example. Yeah. Uh, I, Kalia, I, <clears throat> I was speaking earlier, I don't know if you, you heard that part of my initial presentation about working in NOW, the National Organization for Women. And um, yeah, right. Uh, on the other hand, in other words, it, it is an organization that I would describe as as bourgeois feminist. I'm gonna come back to the feminist thing in just one, one minute. But I mean, I, I think that it's possible to, to work in these organizations around an explicitly anti-racist basis and actually get things done and, 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 and move things. Um, I'm not saying I did this myself. I'm just saying that, you know, when I became involved there, it was, it was clear that there were a few um, women of color who were active in now New Jersey and they immediately gravitated toward being involved with the Combating Racism Task Force and the most anti-racist white women. And then we started getting out there in the streets. And within two or three years, we had a mostly black uh, chapter of the Women of Color and Allies group in Essex County. So it's a matter of, of really sort of, 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 of what you do. But I wanna come back to something that's I think essential in your question, um, which is the, the real definition of feminism. Okay, and actually before this, I wrote to Hester and to my two other favorite uh, Marxist feminists Lisa Vogel and, and Martha Jimenez about what they think of the term feminist and got you know different responses um and and Martha I'll just speak to her uh, she, she about what she had to say she said that she's you know defined herself as a Marxist feminist from the very beginning and she writes incredibly powerful Marxist feminist an analysis sociological and economic analysis she's smart as a whip but she, she said, she returned me and she said, well, but most people seem to think feminist means upper middle-class white women. That's what they think it means. So do you use the term or not? Or do you always have a modifier? Marxist feminist, socialist feminist, materialist feminist, liberal feminist. If most people or many people out there think that that's what feminist means any, anyway. And I, I have this discussion with some of my political comrades who will simply say feminism is the enemy of the, of, of the working class, okay? Um, and I, I, I sort of don't like to concede all of that because I think there is Marxist feminism and I think it is different from bourgeois feminism. But last thing I would say is that the last Now New Jersey conference that I went to, uh, there were some women of color who were on the panel and there are always women of color on the panel, right? You know, even if the audience is 90% white. And at a certain point, a woman in the back an older white woman with some courage said, well, what do, what do you think? She, speak, she spoke to the, the, the women of color on the panel. What, what do you think of, of feminism? And they both said in a way that they knew was gonna be offensive toward most of the people who'd invited them. Well, we think feminism is, is a basically a racist movement. They said it's so, it's so geared into what the outlook and needs are of white women. And of course, I think that's a, you know, a, a bad way of looking at it. But that was that was their understanding of it, and so you know, if that's the case, can one get the right modifier in front of the word feminist? Uh, back in the day, Clara Zetkin and company talked about the woman question, 
right? Well, I'd hate to go back to the woman question. <laughs> Somehow it sounds backward, right? Um, but it, it's, I don't know. I mean, what, what do people think? Is, is the term feminist useful to describe the kind of liberatory politics that are gonna free women and men alike from the, the trammels of gender dualisms and gender binaries and everything that goes along with being part of our common oppression? Is, is the term useful? I don't know. Yeah, I, I think this is really a great question. We need to consider how this actually helping us or actually limiting us to, to um, kind of deal with certain social exploitation and other operation as well. Um, yeah, and so um, just to consider this particular question, um, I guess um, even upper class, I think, or middle class um, women these days are still facing increasing um, care burden. And if we consider um, certain things, probably household work can be outsourced to the market when um, women from lower class or labor from global south might uh, kind of work as a certain way to lower the time uh, or to reduce the time for upper class women. I think this is also increase the possibility for the capitalist class to extract more surplus from the so-called, I hate the term productive class. Um, but mm. the whole idea I think is we are on this aspect in terms of the um, labor exploitation frontier. I think there are more similarities to share than um, kind of to differ. Um, I also think a lot of movements these days do make people um, on the representative women's feel I'm not belonging here. And that's very questionable. Um, I remember we invited an undocumented uh, immigrant from Mexico and she talked about her own experience in college trying to be in a feminist organization, but she was very much excluded and she had to start something um, from scratch because she was not included. Um, and I think this kind of experience was shared by other um, non-binary social groups as well. So this is something I think we should not just go back to the history, but also to constantly uh, question ourselves to reflect how possibly privileged we are and consider other social groups uh, that we should definitely uh, make a united front against uh, oppression. Mm -hmm. Great, okay. Um, so we have a question next from Rodney Green, I believe, on the question of leadership. Rodney? I, um, I, was, I wanted to follow up on something that Hester and uh, Barbara had mentioned earlier about uh, the welfare rights movement. Uh, and I think, uh, to me, the, the role of Black women leadership in all forms of struggle is really central. And that's what I learned in, I think it was 1968 uh, in, in New Haven, where their SDS chapter uh, worked closely with uh, this group called Mothers on the March. And that was my first real political uh, training, I would say. And I, I learned an enormous amount from being involved with that militant group where uh, they would, at a moment's notice, they would organize themselves to march on the welfare office, occupy the director's office and make demands. and. Uh, plus, I learned a whole lot about other things, too, from them. So I, I think that, that we should all be thinking about the central role of Black women in leadership. Now, since then, of course, I'm a professor at Howard University, and uh, we've had a whole series of struggles there uh, over the last uh, 40 years or so. And in almost every case, uh, it's the Black women students who have uh, played a leading role. Our most recent one where we had is where there was a camp, camp out uh, demanding, you know, very basic reforms in the, you know, getting the water running in the dorms and stopping black mold, things like that, you know. Um, but they ended up 
uh, having it was all it was all led by uh, black women students, almost all of it, and uh, some black community organizations joined in as well. And and today I'm I'm involved with uh, a group uh, in the county I live in around police brutality called Community Justice. And uh, again, it's black women that are leading it and organizing it, and I'm that's where I'm continuing to learn from. Uh, and so I think as a kind of a agenda or an action item, I think that uh, all of us. Uh, whatever form of activism we're involved in, really need to look to Black women leadership as a as as a concrete, um, intentional action to try to strengthen our movement. And under that leadership, I think we can get a lot further than uh, I mean, uh, you know, I've been involved a little bit with DSA and you know some other groups and so on. And, and there's a real divide still. And so I think we have to really consciously think about figuring out how we can uh, connect uh, ourselves to um, the leadership of black women more. So that was, that was, I, I was inspired by Barbara and uh, Hester's, uh, comments and started thinking about it a little bit more. That, so I just wanted to share you'd, that. You'd probably be inspired by what's going on down in Haiti. I gather that there's an extremely militant strike, which of, uh, textile workers, most of whom are women, and they're taking on all kinds of stuff under, under conditions of incredible duress, if you know what's going on in the streets in Haiti. So, uh, you know, absolutely. So it's just, it's a matter too of, of, of finding out what's happening because I knew about this strike in Haiti. And so I went online and I tried to get some photographs which would show, you know, black women at the barricades or something. That's kind of what I was expecting to see. And all I saw was pictures of men giving speeches. <laughs> <laughs> all I saw, I didn't see a single female giving a speech. So and, 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 and that's, a, you know, it's, a, it's something to joke about, but I mean, you know, very often the, the thing, what you're talking about is, is sort of dissolved and no, then they might've said of Howard, well, it was black students who, you know, in other words, the fact that it's women within that group who, you know, very often though, not always obviously are involved in, you know, giving that kind of leadership. Um, so, you know, the whole discourse about fighting back is, is, is often skewed against recognizing that and, and having that be part of our knowledge. Yeah. Okay, um, so I think we have a, another question from one of our um, Shelter and Solidarity co-producers, Mark Soderstrom. Um, Mark, go ahead. Oh, thank you. And thank you all so much for this wonderful conversation. Um, it was great to hear Barbara bring up Claudia Jones, right, in connection to intersectionality. Um, but like my students have no idea who Claudia Jones is, right? She's not in the Rutledge collection of feminist thought. Um, and I'm sort of wondering, from your perspectives, who are some of the other voices that may have been ignored or even erased by bourgeois feminism, who we ought to be paying attention to and might be most relevant to our times right now, uh, like Claudia Jones and some of the other feminists? Well activists uh now that barbara's barbara's got me thinking of whether i can use the word feminist or not anymore um but who are some of the other voices who you think we should we should res we should bring back into the conversation um thank you i'd love to hear from you know yeah well <laughs> i mean claudia claudia jones is real important um and she talked about triple oppression and she didn't talk about intersectionality, but she talked about being black and working class and, and female in a very rich kind of way. Um, I mean, one, one can go to the pages of the Communist Party Journal Political Affairs from the late 1940s. Actually, they had some very, very interesting um, debates about how to understand you know, the racialized oppression of, of, of women. Um, I mean, most of the people who are well known, you know, bell hooks, et cetera, and I don't mean to say that in a dismissive way, are, are, not, are not part of the, the communist discourse, okay? Um, and here maybe I'm sounding evasive or something, but I'm really, I'm not a, I'm not a historian of these kinds of theories. Um, the way I know most about it is, is, is through, through literature. And I, I think that, for example, someone like Ann Petrie, theorizes what black women's oppression is about in an incredibly complex and mediated kind of way 
and brings it back to the, the terrain of political economy and in some incredibly subtle ways. I mean, her novel, The Street is, is extraordinary. A short story of hers called Like a Winding Sheet, which I have taught many, many, many times, lays out sexist and racist violence on the basis of alienated labor with the, where the hands that can't do anything at work that is fulfilling become the, the hands that smash the woman, the, his wife uh, in, in the face. Um, so I, I, I think that, you know, we, 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 don't, we don't have to go to political figures or self-defined political figures. I think that there's a, you know, a really rich cultural conversation out there. Um, Lorraine Hansberry, for that matter, you know. Um, yeah, I think Raisin in the Sun is a great Marxist play, <laughs> you know, and it brings a lot of these things into alignment. Um, I don't know. I mean, Marco, are there people that you have in mind that, that you think should be brought into the conversation here? You know, I think I've had I've had arguments as to whether or not people like Alexander Kolontai are feminist, right? Some of my, you know, and and I think I am hoping to create that that we can create a more expansive definition of what feminist is and and save perhaps save it from this idea that it's merely bourgeois feminism. But um, you know, I certainly admire figures like Selma James, who's often ignored by sort of mainstream movement, but it's nice to mm -hmm. see getting a, a larger voice in sort of the left. Uh, Sylvia Federici has been sort of a hero of mine. Yes. Uh, wages for housework, sometimes, which also sometimes call themselves wages against housework, um, yeah. I think have been sidelined by sort of more mainstream feminism. And in terms of literature, um, I'm working right now at trying to find a way to think about Marxist feminism through the work of Nora K. Jemison, um, a speculative author who I think has a powerful sort of linkage of race, colonialism, and family in some of her work. Um, yeah. But I was just so, I, I was, I, when I came to this panel today, I was thinking, I need to ask Barbara a question about Claudia Jones, and then you stole my thunder by bringing her <laughs> up first. So it was it was so nice. Thank you. Okay, I mean, I just know my my research is mainly in the '30s, and there were some really uh, good debates going on. Uh, Grace Hutchin, Hutchins wrote a great book on women and work, or something like that, and it's it's very very Marxist, and it's really engaged with labor movements. And then there was a big debate um, with Mary Inman about this whole question of wages for housework. And I won't get into what side I stand on that debate. The, the point is that there was a very thorough debate that was waged in the pages of the New Masses. Uh, a good book that deals with some of this, again, you know, from the 30s and the 40s, uh, is by Robin uh, Wiegand. And oh God, what's it called? Oh. Um, so, W-E-I-G-A-N-D. Yes. Somebody can look it up. Yeah, and it's really about sort of the the roots of the modern women's li liberation movement in the, the communists of the 30s and 40s. Uh, it's it's really worth, it's a very intelligent book, it's worth reading. I, I just would mention that um, in my book, Feminism Seduced, I have a whole chapter on the role of black women. Um, so that's one source. Um, I, um, Ashley Borer's book on intersectionality has a very interesting chapter on people like Claudia Jones, whom she sees as prefiguring the intersectionality debate in the 20s and 30s as part of the role of black women in the labor movement in the states. So there's a lot of history here. I, I just would say, I mean, this debate about who owns feminism, you know, I'm, I'm reluctant to give up the word, but I think you do always have to have um, a modifier. I mean, if you think about the debates that, you know, Alexander Kollontai and, you know, the Russian feminists had, I mean, they used the word feminist, but they were very clear, you know, as being part of the Russian Revolution, right. that the bourgeois feminists were not on their side. You know, these were the women who were <clears throat> involved with the class that was trying to crush the revolution. So there was always this very, excuse me, <clears throat> very clear class dimension to the discussion of women's rights, you know, and there's a lot of very rich writing about that. And then not to mention all the the whole tradition of black feminists in this country, um, which I, I refer you to my chapter on that. Um, 
Patricia Hill Collins, a number of other writers. Um, you can't just say feminist. I mean, in my view, you just can't say feminist by itself because you have to, there it is, Ashley Bower, thank you, Marxism and intersectionality. Thank you, Sarin, it's in the chat. Um, so I think it's a struggle. That's, I mean, I guess the whole point is it's a struggle for the soul of feminism, really. What, who's, who is going to be represented? Which women? You know, the working women that Zhang Ji talks about are very different from, you know, the Hillary Clintons of this world. I mean, this is such a gulf in class. And that's one of the things that I was trying to say about how feminism was seduced in the United States to turn it away from a radical socialist Marxist attempt to really transform society to an avenue to power and, you know, Christine Lagarde of the IMF and people like that, that, that Barbara was referring to. I mean, these are the world princesses of, of a certain kind of feminism. So I think we come back to class and race, you know, it's always about that. Can, can you have a feminism that represents the working women of this world, you know, the people who are in those sweatshops? So I, I always, I'm, I'm always using a modifier, Marxist feminism, socialist feminism. You, you, I mean, I, I, uh, uh, Victor Wallace said anti-sexism in the chat, I, helpful, but not, uh, I, I, it's a little awkward. I don't think I can really use that, but it's out there. It's out there. <laughs> um, it, can it I- parallels anti-racism. That's what I was thinking. It parallels yeah. anti-racism. Right. I just want to quickly add, uh, while we definitely need to read and reread um, some very um, like feminist writings in the literature, we should also memorize the ones or the, the rebels, the feminist um, rebels in the global south in the third world countries as well. They probably not fight through their writings, Directly, they fight through their actual actions. And mm -hmm. they did that in a very turbulent time, facing a lot of reactionary forces. And these days we are seeing something similar in a lot of uh, countries. We should definitely um, be inspired by these people. Um, regarding the uh, multi-racial um, anti-racist um, kind of that kind of question, I. I was um, in a few meetings with a local activist group called Kansas City Tenants. Um, and it is a group heavily against, you know, um, enclosure and a very uh, gentrification, all these kind of local movements. Uh, mm -hmm. They may not have very great ambition, but it is heavily multi-generational, multi-racial and uh, uh, clearly anti-racial uh, kind of, um, base as they are organization foundation and they started to be more challenging on the racial division of this, uh, the city and doing other organization along with other other progressive movements in the society so I, I and it has a heavy kind of I would say um, presence of women um, and in a lot of debate with local private developers uh, in open sphere, it was actually these female organizers did a great job that impressed all of the audience. So I, I just want to bring up the kind of local, um, very exciting things, yeah, along the same line. Okay, um, well, if we don't have any other um, questions from the audience, I'm not seeing any in the chat. Um, does anybody have a question before I move on? Okay, all right. Well then I will hand it over to um, another co-producer of Shelter and Solidarity, Joe Ramsey, um, to give a quick closing, closing statement and close off the show. Um, Joe? All right, thank you, Lena. And I just wanna thank all of our guests today, uh, including Lena Durkin as host. Thank you, Lena. I know Lena's, you know, carrying a full load of classes at midterms and still helping to, you know, host, you know, the show. Of course, a lot of times 
labor behind the scenes takes is very gendered as well. And I just want to thank Lena for stepping up and, and holding holding the space and, and running such a great discussion. Thank you to Hester, to, to Zong Jin, and to Barbara, and to all of you for being here on what is a very rainy day here in Boston. Um, we will be doing Shelter and Solidarity. We'll be doing another Saturday afternoon show next week on a very important topic. Actually, one of our speakers is also an expert in social reproduction and, and caring work, but our focus will be on the crisis and the war in the Ukraine. We will have a very, I think, rare collection of speakers brought together. I know there's a lot of discourse right now, as there should be, on what this crisis means, what this war means, the history of it, the, the present, the possible future of it. But we will have speakers, uh, Marxist and radical speakers from the Ukraine, from Russia, experts on the uh, political economy of energy in Europe. Uh, we'll have a representative from Jacobin Radio. Um, and I'll just give you the names of these speakers. Olena Yubchenko, who is a, a Ukrainian scholar activist with the Left East Project. That's the Left East Project worth looking up online. I think they've produced some very sensible statements about the current crisis. Susie Wiseman from Jacobin Radio, who's been following this issue closely. Jonathan, Jonathan Feldman, who is that expert on energy politics in and around Europe and beyond. Elisa Lesotnik, a Ukrainian leftist who is now in Spain working to settle and support Ukrainian war refugees. And last but not least, Keti Chukrov, an independent Marxist scholar and activist living in Russia, author of a, what's an amazing book, Practicing the Good. This conversation will be co-hosted by uh, Professor Aviva Chomsky, the labor and uh, international labor historian. Um, and we will uh, welcome you to participate as, as you did today from one o'clock to two, we'll have that panel. And then we'll have, I, I hope an hour long discussion of the political economy, the, the media sources, the, the history and, and the political implications of this war in Ukraine. I hope you can join us for that. Again, that'll be next week, the 19th of March uh, on Saturday at one o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So please mark your calendars and spread the word to friends and comrades. Um, so, sorry, it is the 20th. Seren, uh, yeah, you're right. It's Sunday. I, I, my, my brain is over fried. We moved it to Sunday. So Sunday the 20th, hopefully even better for you. Uh, Sunday the 20th uh, at one o'clock. Uh, and we will correct that in all communications going forward. Okay. So um, to wrap up, Shelter and Solidarity is a collective project that is endorsed by the following organizations, Hardball Press, a publisher of working class and progressive children's stories. Encuentro Cinco, a organizing hub at the center of downtown Boston, Community Church of Boston, the Liberty Tree Foundation uh, for the Democratic Revolution, and of course the journal Socialism and Democracy, a journal, a research journal for activists and the pressing social issues of our time. I want to also thank our production team, including Lena Durkin, Kira Mudliar, Rachel Yarishish Patton, Seren Mudliar, Linda Liu, Mark Soderstrom, and if I left anyone out, uh, consider yourself thanked. It takes, it takes a village to put on a show like this, especially in the middle of the semester. Thank you all and have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Such a pleasure to see you, Barbara. Thank you, Hester. My pleasure, Joe.